you. Anyway, it's great to be with you again. We're back into Romans. Like I said, when we first started this at Christmas, we might get to the end of it by end of the year. It might not. We might just see how we go. But we're in Romans 5, so we better speed up at some point, but I don't think it's today. If you want a title for this morning, I've t- entitled it Choose Life. And I've taken that from Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. It says this, I have set, this is God speaking, or through Moses, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life. Just in case you didn't know which to choose, he says, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life. So the title this morning is Choose Life, at least part one. So I'm putting the foundations down really for next week's message, which is talk about us reigning in life. So we jump into Romans 5 and verse 12, but the problem is it starts with therefore. So we better back up a little bit to find out what the therefore is therefore. So instead of going to chapter 1 and reading all the rest, I encourage you to do that. So I'm going to start at verse 6 and it says, You see that just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by the blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For while we were enemies, uh, God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God but through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received reconciliation. So we've talked about in the past, we've, received, we've been reconciled back to God. Therefore, in light of everything I've just said, it goes on, it says, Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now that answers the question, is, was there any body before Adam? Well, no, because if there were, they wouldn't have died. Because there were no death before Adam. <coughs> so, we aren't jumping into a whole rabbit track on this. There was, it does talk in the Bible about um, angels being on the earth and desolation and, and you know, disaster when Satan and, and the heavenly hosts were fighting. And he got cast down to the earth. But before Adam, there was no man. Because man couldn't have died until Adam sinned. So that kind of unpacks that one a little bit. But you need to look at that yourself. Verse 13. Because you're all looking at me like going, is it going to be that deep this morning? We'll, we'll move on. Verse 13. Beach, um, if anyone's got an Irish ancestry, this is for you. It says, to be sure, sin was in the world. That lined up a bit, didn't it? Uh, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. I could preach on that one, but I want to move on. If there's no law, there's no sin committed because there's no law broken. You get that, don't you? If you're doing 90 down a road where there's no signs in a country where you don't know, if there's nothing telling you what speed it is, until somebody tells you what the speed is, you're not breaking the law unless you've researched it before. So if you're in Germany on the autobahn and you're doing 90, that's fine. But if you're doing 90 over here, you'll get nicked at whatever road you're on. And so it continues. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. I'll read to the end and I'll jump back into these few verses. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if... The many died by the trespass of the one, that's Adam. How much more would God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the results of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. We'll get into this all next week. For if the trespass of the one man's um, one man death reigned through that woman, how much more will those who receive the abundance provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ? That's what we want to jump into next week. So back to verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all have sinned. 
The Bible is quite clear, it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You are not a sinner because you sin, you sin because you're actually a sinner. Anybody born of Adam, anybody who's descended is Adam, that's another reason why there weren't other people around. Adam was the first man, he the first one, and everybody comes from them. Anybody who's a descendant of Adam means that our nature at birth is a sinful nature. That's why we need to be born again, or as they used to say, regenerated, made clean and justified, washed on the inside, a new life, a new creation is what we are. That's why we need to be born a second time of the spirit, not just to be born from a woman. Even that's confusing these days, but everybody's born from a woman. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not taken into account, uh, anyone's account, where there is no sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam um, to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did, who was a pattern of the one to come. See, we're living in interesting times right now. William Booth said this at the end of the 1800s, so the end of the 19th century, which was the end of the 1800s, just as they entered into the 1900s, he said this, he was asked the question, he preached a lot about sin and the danger of sin, and what <laughs> sin does to people and what sin does to mankind, and somebody asked him, so what is the chief danger that you perceive moving into the next century, the 1900s? He said the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit. Now he's talking about Christianity. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, but the Salvation Army is a lot different then than it is now. They were totally sold out for God, on fire, blazing up and down this country and around the world with the Salvation Officers in their uniform, and they took this country and other countries by storm. They were very militant, and they did. but he said this, having a religion without the Holy Spirit, in other words, Christianity where they've moved the Holy Spirit out, um, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. He said the biggest problem that's going to face this world and face this church is when the church removes A, the Holy Spirit out of itself, moves it out. Now, without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be the church because it's the Holy Spirit that comes inside us and brings us alive. He's the one who, re, who regenerates us. He's the one that gives us new birth. Now, we say it's in the name of Jesus, and that's true, and it is Jesus that comes in us, but the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father, they're all connected, they're all one, so you've got to work that one out in your theology. But... The Holy Spirit is the one that draws people to Christ. It's Christ that saved them because of the love of the Father. You get that, don't you? So it's the Holy Spirit that draws people. So when the Holy Spirit's gone, then we end up with a Christianity that's worthless, pointless, and without any power. And then it says Christianity without Christ, and that's what's happening. People want Christianity in their image, not in the image of Jesus. The word Christian means little Christ. That's what we are. Jesus was not a Christian. He is the... He is Christ and we are little Christ. That's what I-A-N means. It means we become like him. And then, so forgiveness without repentance. I know people who's getting saved and they don't even consider asking God for forgiveness and they definitely don't get into repentance. Salvation without regeneration. That just means people who say they're saved but there's no outward working of the internal salvation, what's going on. You see, if somebody becomes a Christian, there should be some things on the outside that change. You can't act like the world and say you're saved. You can't continue doing what the world does and claim to be a Christian. What you are is somebody who's been wet if you're baptised, if you're speaking in a foreign language, even though it's probably not the tongues. And without regeneration, without changing something on the inside, there needs to be an outward working of everything that goes on. If there's a light of Jesus inside you, it will shine out. And when it shines out, people will be drawn to you to find out what's going on inside of the truth and people will be drawn to you because they don't like you. It's not you who don't like, it's Jesus they don't like. And then he goes on, he says, politics without God. That happened a long time ago. They got rid of God and our country went downhill from that point. And there's heaven without hell. We can't have heaven without hell. Hell is real and heaven is real. And yet Jesus spoke a lot more about hell than he did heaven and warned people often, yet that's something that's not often spoke about. 
So sin came in through one man. So we need to jump right back to the beginning of the Bible. This is an easy one. Go right to the beginning of the Bible. Open it up. You'll see a page saying Bible or Holy Bible. Skip a few pages. You'll see one called Genesis. It's after the one with numbers on saying what page the books are in. Get to Genesis. Go to chapter 2. That's an easy one to find. And nobody's moving any pages. So I'm assuming you're all on your devices. Hopefully not playing solitaire or, you know, putting a bet on at the local races. There we go. So Genesis 2, verse 8, it says, Now God, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed, and the Lord made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So they're good to look at, and they're really good to eat. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and then it says this. So God put Adam in the garden to work it and took after it. See, people think work is part of the curse. No, people were working before the curse came. So, and the Bible does say, get a job. Just put that one out there. Verse 15 says, the Lord took the man, put him in the garden to work it and care for it. That's what I just said. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for that when you eat of it, uh, you will surely die. It's interesting that God said you can have everything in the garden. Yeah. Now, we don't know how big the garden was. We don't, I'm not assuming it was the size of my garden, because he could hide. He couldn't hide in my garden. So it was pretty good and it had lots of trees. So it's going to be pretty, it's like a park. And he was a big keeper, was Adam. And he said, you can eat from every tree in it except for one. So where did his attention go? To the one. Actually, his attention didn't go because he was a man. And men don't notice things. <laughs> they go, yeah, okay. Walked off. You know, Adam was a very smart person, by the way. Why? Because he named all the animals and he remembered what he called them. You know, it's not what he's where I put my keys, with my glasses. He named every animal and he remembered them. So we know Adam was smart. If you think about... One question that historians can't tell us is where, who invented bread? See, I believe that God didn't just make Adam and sit in the garden and go, uh, uh, learn. You know, he gave him knowledge and wisdom. Who, made, who designed bread? Have you ever thought about bread? You get grass and you crush it. You sieve it. You put some animal fat in there, a bit of water and, and this bacteria stuff. You let it warm and grow for a bit, and then you need it a bit more. Then you do it again, then you bake it. Who thought of that? God must have told him how to do that. Because it's impossible to design by actually fault, you know, bacteria and this mush in that bread with grass seeds. It kind of gets a bit complicated. So God gave Adam a good mind and a good wisdom. So Adam's in the garden, and it's, it's, it's not doing good. Why? Because later on it says, uh, it's, a, it's not good for man to be alone is where we get to but when he said this he says you must not eat for the fruit of the tree of good and evil of the knowledge of good and evil for when you do you will certainly die in our bibles we just read it as you're going to die eat the fruit you'll die but the word die there means more than that because in the young's literal translation it says if you eat of the fruit and in that day you will be die dying because death by definition is a separation. You know, if your spirit gets separated from your body, your body dies. Because it's your spirit that gives life to your body. It's not the air that you breathe, it's not the blood running around. If you haven't got a spirit inside you, it's head. So, separation. In the Septuagint, it says, you should eat of it, you should not eat of it. So when you do, from it, die, you shall die. There's two deaths here. There's a spiritual death and there's a physical death. Now, God wasn't being harsh here. We'll get into the other bits and bobs. But actually, if you think about it, God showed grace at this point. Because he says, if you do that, you'll die. He warned him up front. He just didn't let it go. Verse 18, this is a still Genesis 1. The Lord says, it is not God for, good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And obviously, you know, sorry, he brings all animals. None of them's found that's any good for him. So he makes him go to sleep, then he formed woman. And it says, Then the Lord made woman. And Adam and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. That's important. Chapter 3. Then it says, 
So Adam and Eve's pottering around in his garden, having a great time. Things are doing well. Perfect dad, perfect garden, perfect situation, and the kids rebel. God's kids, so if you're a parent, you've got to oh. But chapter 3 says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals of the, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? First of all, she never actually was shocked by an animal speaking to her. Does this mean animals spoke? Well, we're not sure, but we do know later on a donkey does speak. Um, so we're not sure, but it didn't shock her. But she did say this. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say. So he said, did God say? She said, God did say. Uh, so she's reminded him what she was said, but actually it wasn't told to her, it was told to Adam. But she said, you must not eat of the fruit of, uh, of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And then she added this, you must not touch of it or you will die. So, if you want a story and you want a quick story, ask the man. He'll tell you what happened, and he'll tell you what happened at the end. That's it. If you want the dramatised, amplified version, ask a woman. Because she'll tell you everything. The <laughs> colours, the tree. See, you can tell a man wrote this, because if it had been a woman, she'd have told you the colours of the flowers, and the trees, and the shapes, and the, everything would have been there. man just goes, do, 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 it's there. Done. So, anyway. So, the serpent's having a chat to her, and she says, yeah, God did say we shouldn't eat of it, and you must not touch it. Now, God didn't say that, but that's beside the point. You will certainly not die. So the devil says, did God say, bring him down? Then he brings out an absolute lie. So this is a process of sin, remember? You will not certainly die, the serpent said to him, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, remember, they were already like God. God made them in his image. They were amazing, and there was also speculation what they were really like. But they, there's lots of things about how awesome and amazing it was for them. And he offered them something that they didn't have. But like kids, you tell them they can have all this, but don't touch that. They want to touch the stuff they're not supposed to. Why? Because that's inbuilt to us. Because that's called the sin nature before we become Christians. Now Adam didn't have that, and he didn't have that, but the curiosity was there. So she's like looking at this fruit. So she was like, and then it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to her, now we know it was. It wasn't a disfigured, ugly tree like all the rest. Just don't touch that one. And also, this is the problem. She also desired for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate, and ate it. Now, Adam was the wisest person around there. Because he was the only one till his wife come. And now there's a struggle going on. Who's the wisest? Who's the best looking? Now, they're both naked and standing there, walking around, they didn't feel any shame, but this curiosity is starting. See, we don't know how long this took. We don't know how long she looked at that tree or gazed at the tree. We don't know what, we read it as if it happened in five seconds, but we don't know that. It could have happened over an hour, it could have happened over days or weeks, it could have been just a, a gentle dripping. Now the devil's often attacks us by giving us little subtle things initially before he comes in for the full attack. This is just an outline of what the devil does and we need to be aware of that. He starts by bringing doubt, then he brings an absolute lie, then he challenges them to give them something that they don't think they already have and then they're entering into sin. And the devil does the same with us, he'll always offer you something what seems better in the short term, but in the long term it always leads to death. You see, the Bible says that, you know, for, that sin does lead to death. And you think, well, that just means dying, but it means more than that. If somebody spies out an, the, another person, they're married, and they start flirting around and they'll have an affair, that sin will bring death to their marriage and to their family unit. And two other things, if you steal, it brings death to your employment, if it's at work or you get locked up. It, sin always brings death at some point into your life. James 1, 14 to 15 says this, that each person is tempted. So people often say, well, you know, it's all right to be tempted. But James says this, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and are enticed. See, nobody can tempt you to do something that you don't actually want to do. Do you know that? You can only be tempted to do something that you want. 
You see, I can walk down certain aisles in Tesco's or Morrison's or Asda, and it don't bother me. I'm not interested in the gluten-free department, the meat-free department. It doesn't bother me. I can walk on by. Go down the chocolate biscuit aisle. Ooh, there's temptation now. Why? Because I want them. I like them. I would like them. So I'm sometimes going to march my way through. Some things are tempting, some things aren't. But James says, it's only our own evil desires that entice us. Then, this is the key, then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. You see, everybody sins in their mind first. Then it's outworked into the flesh. Nobody gets up one morning and goes, you know what, I'm going to kill somebody. It's often worked out in my mind. Nobody says I'm going to keep having an affair. It's in the mind first. Nobody says I'm going to do whatever. It's in the mind first. They see it in the mind. It's conceived in the mind. Then it gives birth to sin and it's outworked into the physical. See, in the New Testament, Jesus often spoke about that if you look at somebody lustfully, like you've sinned, you commit committed adultery. In the Old Testament, you actually, you actually had to commit adultery to have committed adultery. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, look at someone lustfully and you've committed adultery. And we'll move on from that one. But that's where it is with God. In 1 John 2, 16, it says, the world offers only the cravings of the physical pleasure. See, the world, this is what the world's offering, the devil's offering, only a craving of physical pleasure, a craving of everything we see, and the pride of our achievements and possessions. People everywhere... A craving, what I want, what I want, I deserve it, I want to do this. Everywhere you go, people, it's about what they want to do, it's their physical cravings. Then they're, they're, they're what they see, I want, I want, I want this. You know, in other countries, there's no difference, in a lot of other countries around the world, they've found out that hardly anybody suffers from depression, anxiety, worry. But they're the countries where they don't have <coughs> the latest iPhones, the latest Samsung, to balance that one out, the trainers. The latest is that have advertising. So they don't know what they're missing out on. But it's in psychology, they say this want for something more drives people to worry, stress and anxiety. And I thought anxiety and worry and stress was some mental condition. Yeah, it is, but it's born out of that built-in desire that we need to take hold of that I want something. I want it. What I see, I want. What I deserve. Have you ever seen those adverts? It don't bother me. You want to say, you know, use this sort of shampoo because you deserve it. No, I ain't got hair. And I don't deserve it anyway because I don't care. You know, bar of soap was always good enough for me, even when I had hair. It was special soap, though. It was shield. Anyone remember that? <laughs> it wasn't really. I use shampoo. But um, it says, all these things, the pride of life, the pride of the eyes and the pride of our achievements and they are not from the Father but from the world. When you get cravings that are beyond yourself, when you're desiring things, be very careful. If it's in your heart and you're desiring to serve God, that's a good one. But if you're desiring the latest, 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 yeah, that's a, a, another sermon also and we'll get into that at some point. Right, so it says, this is in verse 6, uh, Gen Genesis verse 3, verse 6 says, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now we don't know if he was literally stood next to her or if he was with her in the garden. We're not quite sure. People have different opinions on that. But what we do know is she, she ate him and she gave some to him. And he took it and he ate it. Then their eyes of both of them were open and they realised they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together so they had the knowledge of sewing already in them and to cover themselves up and to make coverings for themselves. But we need to understand that sin came through man, through Adam. You see, in 1 Timothy 2 verse 14, it says, And Adam was not deceived, it was a woman who was deceived, deceived and became a sinner. She was deceived. Adam sinned. If Adam had said, woman, you have messed up. We need to go talk to God. We wouldn't be in this mess we're in. Because God told him, and he told her, and she did what some people do and ignored it, because she knew better. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> it's hard work. Ooh. Don't talk about the sexes. 
No, it's a fact of life that she got deceived. But he sinned. And it's his sin that brought sin into the world. Her deception did not bring sin into the world. She was to say, why do you think the devil went after her for? Because he couldn't get her place with Adam, but Eve could. You know, I can have influence in your life, but I'll tell you this, the pillar talk is more influential to you than what I can be. That little whispers in your ears at the pillar time. So, she was deceived, but Adam sinned. Adam chose to sin, do you know that? He was presented with the fruit, he knew where it was from, and he chose, this is unbelievable. See, it's, I told you earlier that Adam was a type of Christ, that's what we read, he was a type or a pattern of the one to come, Jesus. And this is where it gets really, this is in Genesis 3. So Adam chose to stand with his wife in her predicament and in her sin <coughs> against God. He chose that, he took the fruit, and he knew what was coming. People say, oh, Adam probably didn't know. No, he knew disobeying God would bring death. Dying, he would die. He knew that. So he chose to stand with his wife. Adam chose to stand with his wife in her predicament, but sinned. Jesus chose to stand with his bride in our predicament, but without sinning. You see, Adam chose to stand with Eve and take the consequences. Jesus chose to come to this world and stand with his bride. He took the wrath of God on himself. He took the sins of the world on himself because of his love for us. Adam stood with his wife because he loved her so much. Jesus stood with his bride, us, because he loved us so much. You see, we read through Adam and Eve's story and just move on to the next thing. But it's a symbol of the pattern of the one to come. That Adam was a type of Christ and he stood with his bride, yet he sinned. Jesus stood with his bride but did not sin. And therefore, because he didn't sin, he could purchase his bride. He could wash his bride clean. He could forgive his bride of his sins. And he could redeem and take her one day home to be with him. Which is an amen point. That's what Jesus... So he's a type of Adam. He's a type of Christ. Because it often talks about Adam's the first Adam. And Jesus is the last Adam. Because Jesus became like Adam. So he could receive his bride where Adam was Adam, received his bride, but it led to sin. There's a whole thing in there that we often miss because we're trying to read on to the story. It says that then man heard, that, sorry, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of evening. So it's the evening time and um, God's turned up. And it says, and they hid. It's a problem with mankind ever since. That whenever sin's involved, the first thing people do, and you may do this as well, I reckon that you do, and most people do, they hide from God. When sin enters, they run from God. I often know this, and we're, no, none of you guys, because you're here, but when people are going through a difficult time, when sin's entered, what's the first thing to do? They stop coming to church. Why? Because I believe God can speak to me through YouTube. Yes, he can. But there's a reason why I believe or step away from church for a season is because they don't want anybody rubbing them the wrong way when they say to them, how are you doing? I'm sinning like the devil, how do you think I'm doing? <laughs> they don't want to want to lie through the teeth and say everything's okay. I'm a part-time Christian and today isn't my Christian day. That's on a Tuesday. But they hid from God. And the Lord walked amongst the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to man and said, where are you? And that's the cry of God throughout the centuries. Man sins, man hides. And God says, where are you? You see, wherever you are, God knows where you are. He knows exactly where. Read Psalm 139. You can't go anywhere from God. He knows where you are. The fact that he asked, where are you, gave man a chance to respond. God knew where he was. God can see through trees. He knows everything. He knows the lot. They couldn't hide from him. So anyway, he knows where you are. When you sin, he sees you. When you are sorrowful, he sees you. When you're angry and bitter and hateful, he sees it. He also sees when you're in pain. When you're hiding from him or in a situation of hopelessness, he still sees. And the response but everybody is the same response that everyone's got to make. They either run to God or run away from God. 
In sin and in sorrow and anger, in pain and hopelessness, either people run towards God or run away from God. My question is, what do you do? And even today, people still do that, but yet God is still the same. He stands with open arms. See, he knows our sins before we even tell him about them. He knows when we've been annoyed and angry and we've done whatever we've done. He knows that. But he still stands there with open arms. And he's expecting us to run to him in repentance. A word that's not often used, but run to, us, run to him in repentance and say sorry for our sins. And he wipes them away. Or you can carry him for two weeks, two months, two years, ten years. Suffer with it for ages. And eventually learn the lesson. Duh. I'll take this to God. The devil will say, run, run, run. God says, just come to me. Even messed up and broken. And I know this. And I've seen it over years. That when someone is broken, messed up, that's the place where God says, I can really start to do something with you. When there's pride, and I don't need God, and I'm doing all right, thank you. I'm a Christian, but I go on a Sunday. God goes, right, okay. But when someone hits rock bottom, when somebody actually knows they've messed up and they come to God, then God can really use them. Look at David in the Bible. Classic. Somebody who really messed up. This week, I went over to... Uh, I've got to be careful on names and places. Um, I went over to an hospital because I got a text saying, can you pray for this person? Uh, they're in hospital, they need prayer. And I said, no, I will not pray for them. However... I will go over and pray for them. Now, the reason I did that, because I'm getting tired of people saying, will you pray, will you pray? Pray what? What? Just pray. Pray what? How do we know if God's answered the prayer if we don't put a subject in the prayer? <laughs> Bless me, Lord. God goes, how do you want blessing? See, if I said bless me and he gave me some, some salad... I don't want that, that's not a blessing. That they passed on to somebody else and become a blessing to them. I'm not, that's not a blessing to me, so I'd never ask for a salad. Unless they got to extreme circumstances. But, what are you praying for? What are you asking for? So this, I got a text, so they said, yeah, go, go see a woman, she'll see you. So I went over to this hospital, and I marched in, and I'd had to tidy myself up, because I go um, outside this entire, I went in as reverent, because that's what I am. So I went in, and I got chance this lady, and I was there for over an hour with her. And I said, I'm here to pray for you. I, I know of her, um, and she knows of Joe and I. And um, I said, I'm going to pray for you. So I prayed for her, so I have to talk to her a while. And I said that afterwards, so are they all right? She said, yeah, it's like a warm blanket of peace has just come over me. Mm -hmm. She was laid in bed with her eyes closed. Going. Now, she'd had a blood transfusion, and she looked as rough as anything. Not just because her hair was a mess, but she looked really bad. And... Um, I just prayed, and she kind of ran. I said, I'll come tomorrow for to see you. She said, I'm probably going to be in for the rest of the week. She says, this warm blanket. She said, don't take it away. I said, it's not mine to take away. It's the Holy Spirit just working it. Then I had the privilege of leading her back to God, because she, she made a decision some time ago, and she's not really done anything with it. So I had the privilege of praying with her, leading her back to God. So I awesome, mate. So I went out. I'm skipping. Life's good. Life's amazing. What made it even better is when I drove into the car park, in this hospital, there's a massive car park, but you can't park in it, there's cars park everywhere, and there's one place left, and I got it. Well, everybody was arguing about other things, I just snipped him down the car, there it was. And I didn't have to pay, because the barrier were up when I went out, so that's even better. So the next day, I goes over, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, looking like I've been in Narnia, and drives over, it's about 40 minutes away, and, um, I drive in and the car park, and look, I'm looking again, it's horrendous again. I thought, Lord, you know what I need. And as I pulled the corner, there's a ticket machine, and the parking space right empty, just the other side of the fence. So I thought, that's mine, drove all the way in. And again, there were a bit of turmoil going on with people arguing about parking spaces and stuff like that. So I just nipped around, followed around, and just pulled in. Got out, got my ticket, went in, and I'm marching into the hospital. You know when you're on a march? There's way to go. I'm off. And I looked at this woman and my heart went out to her. She sat against the low step and a barrier. And she's got her back to it with her head down. And my heart went out to her and I said, and I nearly said to her, you know, are you all right? But I'm, I've got somewhere to go. I'm going somewhere. And as I walked past this woman, I said, Johnny. So I looked around, there's somebody I know. 
She's just had um, she's got she's just had some lumps removed from her chest. Her lymph nodes have been taken out a few days ago, and she'll back for a checkup. So I was talking, I spent about like ten minutes talking to her, and just said, "Look, you know, we're praying for you," and I just encouraged her. And she says, "This is awesome. It's amazing." And I said, "Just let the peace of God." She's a Christian. I know it's church girl. So I said, "Just let the peace of God be around you." Don't struggle, don't strive, don't worry about these things. God's got a plan, God's got a purpose. And gave her a word from God and she said, my dad's here, I better go. So she shoots off waving and says, say hello to Joe. And she went. So now I'm back on mission into hospital. Marched our way up, up and stairs, because I don't use lifts, I want to be exercising. Got there, marched my way in, knocked on the door open. It was a guy stand, sat there with a big beard. And I thought, oops, wrong room, back up. She'd gone home. So I went to the counter, I said, where is she? She's gone home. When did she go home? Yesterday. I said, she was dying yesterday almost. Yeah, but she got better really quickly. So I'm like, this is amen. This is brilliant. I've ministered to somebody. This is awesome. So then I thought, right, I'm on my way out. Kind of disappointed because I've got my Bible to give and stuff like that. Went out and I'm marching out again. And I'm marching past somebody and someone says, Johnny, how are you doing? Turned around the lady I've not seen for about 20 years. <laughs> like, oh. How are you? How are you? I said, which church are you going to nowadays? It was one of those moments when God started speaking. Which church? Are you? She goes, I haven't been to a church for years because of blah, 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 blah. She goes, I got hurt in church. I goes, so what? Families hurt each other. People hurt each other. Churches hurt each other. I said, that's life. Get over it. But you don't know what they did. I said, I don't care what they did. I said, you've got a gift on your life. And so is your husband, Jonathan. I said, you've got a gift on your life that is awesome and amazing, that you can encourage people and you smile and your singing voice and stuff like that. And she goes, that's prophetic, isn't it? Now, I didn't know it was at the time, but it said so much to her. <coughs> and she just went, so we're talking, we're talking, we're blessing. And she goes, I've got a point, I've got to go. So she runs up, so now I am on cloud nine. <laughs> Problem is that I had somewhere to go, but God had people for me to meet. You see, hiding from God Cuts you off from meeting people that God wants to minister to. Being focused on your own life is cutting you off from touching lives that God wants you to touch. And it might only be a smile. It might only be a word of encouragement. It, only, it might be just something about how you do it. So let me encourage you. God's on the move and he's doing some awesome things at the minute. Verse 12. We're still in Genesis here, I think. Yep. Uh, therefore... Uh, Sorry, back in Romans now, that's it. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, death came through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all are sinned. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 says this, to 25. For since death came through one man, that's Adam, the resurrection of the dead came through one man, that's Jesus. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, alive doesn't mean just at the end. You're made alive. You're alive. You're alive. At least act like you're alive. You know, and it says this, For we all must reign until... Sorry, he, as Jesus, must reign until he puts all the enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death entered in at the beginning because of sin. When God deals with sin, he deals with the devil. And he's going to destroy death right at the end. Which I think is amazing. So when he's sorted everything else, there'll be no more death. Nobody will die. You see, death is actually God's grace. You know that, don't you? Because if, if God didn't bring death upon mankind when they sinned, we'd live forever in sin with the consequences of sin. Imagine living forever with AIDS, with another disease, where it constantly eats at you, but you never die. That's grace, isn't it? See, we think it's... Uh, it's a disaster to God. It's his grace. So, um, 1 John 5, 11 says this. And this is a testimony God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. The only way we receive eternal life, the only way we receive life is in Jesus. Then it continues. He answered, I, this is Adam now, back to Adam. He says, I answered and heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. And then he said, who told you you were naked? I'd love to preach that sometime. Who told you? Who told you you were ugly? Who told you you were worthless? Who told you you were stupid? Put whatever you want on there. Who told you you were damaged? 
Who told you you'll never do any good? Who told you you're worthless? Who told you these lies? Second question, why do you believe them? See, some people think I'm crazy because I don't believe all that rubbish. So I work out, that's a lie, I don't believe it. And people think I'm nutters. Because they believe a lie, they're the stupid, they're an idiot. Now they might, be not as, might not have as much common sense. They may not be as smart. But that doesn't mean they're stupid. It doesn't mean they're worthless. <coughs> they may be ugly. But God looks on the inside, not the outside. The world looks at the outside with all this drama. God looks at the heart and sees you as awesome and amazing. God sees you for who you really are, not what the world says you are. You know, people's had words spoke over you and you've taken to heart. They've taken seed and they've produced fruit in keeping with the word said. See, my dad told me I was stupid, I was stupid, I was stupid. You're really stupid. You're stupid. You're constantly stupid. That's all he ever said to me. That's encouraging, isn't it? I thought my teacher said to me, I know, but I know them. I went, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to prove you. Now, that's what you say. That's your attitude, Johnny. It's because that's what I do. Even I gave in to it. I'm stupid, I'm stupid. Yeah. Be a forest gum for the rest of my life. Or, I did some of that. Now, fortunately, I got saved. And I tell myself what the Bible tells me about me, and I get really encouraged. I get really encouraged, and I think it's amazing, it's awesome, but I am a child of God, but I am more than a conqueror. But I will run demons out of towns. That I will see the sick healed. That I will see the dead raised. That I will see people saved through the name of Jesus. Amen. Not because I'm special, but because I know where I'm in Christ. And that's what it all boils down to. So let me find out. So Adam hid and he says, you know, I was afraid. And God said, who told you you were naked? And then he confessed all. I have eaten the, the tree that, uh, from the tree that you told me not to do. And I have eaten from it. And the, the man said, and this is it started here. The man said, the woman you put here with me, the gift, an amazing gift, God, that you gave me, it's her fault. <laughs> That's what he was saying. You see, people have been married 20 years often say to me, Johnny, she's not the woman I married. I say, I often say, she were all right when you married her. She were okay then, it's because of you, mate. And vice versa, I don't always blame him. I, I throw it a bit away. So, the woman you gave me. So he looked, God looked at the woman. Uh, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent has deceived me and I ate. It's like people tell me, uh, I got drunk and I couldn't help it. Like they ticked it down your throat. You know, I, mean? I had an affair and it, I, don't, I don't know how it happened. Yeah, your brain moved. It kind of, you're not stupid, it happened. So the Lord said to the serpent, now again, this is God's grace. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock, of all the wild animals, you will crawl your belly and you will dust all your work, all the days of your life. Then there's a prophetic word comes out, right at the beginning, and I will put, this is God's speaking, and I will put entity between you and the woman, between her offspring, uh, your offspring and hers. Now in the original, it talks about between your seed and her seed. Women don't have seed. Biology lesson, ladies have eggs. Men have seeds. Women, don't want to get into, too much into this, kids. But women have eggs, men don't. Men have seed, but women don't. Biology lesson over. So God says, between your offspring, talk to the serpent, the devil, and her offspring. He's prophesied that Jesus will come one day. And this is what's going to happen. He will crush your head and you will strike at his heel. You will crucify him, but he will destroy you. The first prophetic message of the coming Messiah is right there when man sinned. Which I think is exciting. But then it gets even better. Verse 21 said, Then the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and for his wife and clothed them. So he didn't leave them destitute. He didn't leave them naked there. He actually did something. He killed some animals, made some skins, and he put them on man and his wife. And then the Lord said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. That's an interesting thought. Isn't it? God knows good and evil. He knows what evil is. Man didn't. That's when people say to me, well, unless you've experienced it, you don't know. Now, I've never been set on fire. 
So I'm not going to go there neither. No, I've had a car crash, I've had been over crashes and stuff, it's been fine. I survived it. But I won't want to go there again. The Lord says, man has become like him, knowing good and evil. You must, he must not be allowed to reach his hand out and take from the tree of life and eat it and, and live forever. That's God's grace. We're going to stop him. Now, the tree of life actually ends up in Revelation um, in heaven. So the Lord banished the man from the Garden of Eden uh, to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he, re he placed on the east side of the garden a cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth, guarding the way to the tree of life. A cherubim's not a little fat baby. It's a big awesome angel with a massive sword. And one angel, it says in the Bible, went out and killed 180,000 people in one night. So these angels are not dim, stupid and girlies. They are warriors for God. Now the interesting thing is he said he's going to guard the way um, to the tree of life. So is he guarding it saying stop, go no further? Or is he guarding it to keep it open for the redemption plan of God? Through Jesus leading to the tree of life that we may live forever. It's an interesting thought. See, we've got ways we think, and yet God may not think the same way. There are two kinds of people. This is what Re 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 Leonard Ravenhill said, Ravenhall said. There are two kinds of people in the world. Only two kinds. Not black and white, not rich or poor, but either dead in sin or dead to sin. So this morning, you're either dead in sin, where sin rules in your life, or you're dead to sin, where life rules in your life. Which one are you? This is what uh, Moody once said, the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. People who read the Bible are not running around sinning, but pe Christians who are running around sinning, if that's what they really are, are not reading the Bible. Look at your own life, analyze your own past. When you're in the word, when you're around believers, you're not actually often messing around. But when you're not, you soon slide. You may not be in the right place with God. You may have sin in life. My word to you this morning is do not hide from God, run to God, repent. Because right at the beginning I said this verse, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. I have set before you life or death. <coughs> Blessings and curses. Choose life and live. Even in sin, you can still repent and come before God. Adam chose to stand with his wife, which led to sin, which led to death. Now we do know from, this, from what happened thereafter that they didn't forsake God, they just messed up. But they had the consequence of And sometimes when we sin, we've still got the consequences of sin to live with thereafter. But don't hide from God, don't run from God, run to God, repent of it and choose life. Because if you sin and you choose death, it will kill you. Yes, you may still be alive physically and you may have the opportunity to come back to God and put it right with God. But at the end of it all, God says, don't run, choose life. I'm not talking about one from 80s with a t-shirt. She will choose life, choose God. Choose a way of blessings instead of a way of cursing. Choose life instead of choosing the way of death. Because your choice will take you into places you don't want to go. It will either take you to life or it will take you to death, and it's your choice. See, nobody can make you do anything. <coughs> nobody can force you into doing anything at all. People say, it's because of them. No, it's not. It's your choice. It's my choice. It's our choice. Nobody can make you do anything you don't want to, unless they are so strong, and they can beat the living daylights out of you, and they can overpower you in some physical struggle <coughs> or something like that, or manipulation over a period of time, what they call it, gaslight in you or whatever. They can do that. But beyond that, it's your choice. It's your choice to step onto that path that leads to the dark side, if you want to go. You see, drinking's never been a problem for me because I've never really got into it. But I've seen so many Christians say it's okay to have one drink. It is. It's okay to have two drinks. Yeah, it is. It's okay to have a few drinks. Yeah. It's okay. And then next thing, they're in a mess. Because it was okay, but now it's not. See, it's okay to flirt. Well, it isn't. If you want to know if it's okay to flirt, flirt with your husband or wife stood next to you. You'll find out how okay it is. 
They will, they will <laughs> let you know. Choose life or choose death. It's your choice. Choose blessings, choose curses. <laughs> and then he says this, I like it, he said, but choose life. In other words, I'll give you a clue. Answer to the test. Choose life and live. Be awesome for God. Amen. Yes, you'll crash. Yes, you'll burn. Yes, you'll sin. You'll... And actually, as Christians, we can't mistakenly sin. We choose to sin. Do you know that? But we've got a God who loves us so much. And I'm, and I'm very careful because, you know, we're getting into Romans and some stuff there. We still need to repent. In Revelation, he says to seven churches, you need to repent. Well, I did that when I got saved. No, you need to repent. When you know you've done something, repent of it. Turn away from it. Turn your thinking to God's thinking. And ask God just to continue to give you life. Now, I'm going to shut up because we've been going on a long time. But I hope that's been great for you. That's part one. Next week is about living life. Reigning in life. I mean, I'd set this down so you know the negative, then you'll see the positive, but even in the negative, there's life. Even in the negative, there's still grace. Even at the worst time of this creation that God's made for us, even at the fall of man, the grace of God was straight in there with a prophetic word about the Saviour that's coming for the world. And I think that's really good. You'll never read Genesis 1, 2 and 3 the same, will you now? So let me pray for you, and then we'll make fruit to the back. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you're doing. And I pray right now that you will stir our hearts up. Lord, let your word settle in our hearts. Let it grow, become good seed on good soil and produce a good harvest. Lord, let us never forget what you've done for us. And Lord, show us the hurt and the pain that our sin causes you day by day. But let us know, Lord, that you're a loving God who embraces and brings us back and establishes us. You set our feet on solid ground, Lord. You do turn us around. You do set us off in a new direction. Why? Because of your love for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.